Um, welcome to the ITP Support Association Pediatric uh, Patient Zoom meeting for ITP Awareness Week 2023. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. John Granger. Uh, he's a chap with the glasses and the blue shirt. <laughs> Uh, okay. John is from uh, Manchester Children's Hospital, and I'd also like to welcome Rhonda Anderson. Rhonda is our senior patient mentor, and she always hates me saying that, but I will anyway. Um, just a quick couple of points before we do kick off with the meeting. As many of you will already be aware, this is ITP Awareness Week. Um, so far this week, it's actually been very very hectic um i just published today two videos um last night we did a uh webinar with our colleagues in the usa australia and italy we had on there dr nicola cooper and dr cindy nuna from the usa and that has now just been published on our youtube channel and there's lots of good information on there it's all about shared decision making, etc., and all that. And in addition, uh, we also published this morning uh, a very, very short motivational video that three of our ITP patients um, did on our behalf. And it's only about 90 seconds long, but I ask everyone to actually go to our YouTube channel and just watch it because it it's really got some positive messages in it. But anyone with ITP. Uh, the title of the video is No Bad Blood. So that, that gives you a hint of which way it's going, but it's really good. So I've uh, got another chap just entering, Derek Halston. Derek is another one of our patient mentors, by the way. So welcome, Derek. Hi, Derek. And I'd also like to say this meeting is being recorded because um, we always get uh, messages after the event saying, sorry, I couldn't make it. Was it recorded? Because, you know, they'd like to, you know, catch up on what's going on. So if anyone's got, wants to kick off with a question, uh, just uh, put your hand up. Audrey, Hannah, DL, Gina, anyone? Oh, hello. Can I ask a question? First? Of course you can, Hannah. Yeah. Hey, um, it's regarding my daughter. So my daughter got IPT and when oh, she ITP, sorry, when she was 10 weeks, 10 weeks old. Um, and she got it about 10 days after she had her first set of six in one vaccines. Um, and so obviously we're concerned about the next lot of vaccines because there's three lots of them. Um, and so we're wondering whether we can get some advice on how we can do that safely without triggering the ITP again, because the um, haematology department in St. George's have advised that it's likely that it will be triggered again by the next set of vaccines. Um, and so is there a way of getting the vaccines done separately? Um, which virus is most likely to trigger um, the reaction, et cetera? So, yeah, we're just wondering about that, really. Brilliant. John? So, yeah, quite happy just to kick off with that. So just for the latecomers, let me introduce myself. So I'm John Granger. I'm based up in Manchester Children's Hospital. Um, and I've been a medical advisor with ITP support, I think, for about 25 years now. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, we set up the first sort of centre of excellence for paediatric ITP up here. Um, and we've also been supported for many years by the ITP Support Association, to run an ITP registry. And actually one of the things which we have looked at has been sort of the vaccination induced ITP. So we did a report on that about five years ago, if I recall correctly. Um, at, at the time of going in and looking at it, it was quite well reported that the MMR vaccine in about one in 40,000 people after the MMR vaccine was developing an ITP illness. Um, our work actually, when we did the reviews, we found more cases of vaccine-induced ITP after the 16-1 vaccine than we were actually seeing after the MMR. Um, the data that we have is that we tend to see the same 
level of drop in plate that counts and the same initial severity of bleeding in the vaccine induced ones as we do in any of the other ITPs. But the vaccine induced ones are much more likely to be a shorter illness, usually recovering very, very quickly without any intervention. And in the ones which we looked at, we didn't come across any recurrences. And I personally have not seen anybody with ITP following the six in one or indeed after the MMR um, who had a recurrence after their repeat vaccines. Now, of course, any immune challenge, whether it's an actual infection or whether it's a vaccination, potentially can heighten the immune system. Um, and more commonly in people who still have active ITP, it can drive the counts lower. But yes, there, there is a theoretical risk of it can trigger a second episode. Um, normally with most families, I quote about one in 20 chance of having a second episode. And again, that's from our registry data. And I think, and potentially the vaccination or an infection can trigger lows. Now, of course, if you, you know, in the past, some people have suggested separating the vaccines. Um, challenge with that, of course, is it means multiple, multiple injections over quite a protracted time period. Theoretically, any one of those ones could trigger it. And there is, in answer to your question, is there any particular one? Um, we don't have data to know whether any of those are more likely to trigger it. Again, I think it is the combination. You know, we clearly saw an increase in ITP associated when it moved to the six in one from the previous, I can't remember if it was four in one or five in one, but, but as it expanded, we saw more of those. Um, again, general data, when I've spoken to our immunology team around sort of separating vaccines, actually probably only about 20% of children who embark on a separated single vaccine program actually ever complete the vaccination program. So, um, my big worry is we're increasing the risk of what should be a relatively mild transient ITP illness for potential risk of a, you know, some of the what we're trying to protect with the vaccines is against known potentially sort of fatal infections. So our, our policy here is to try and hold on until the IT P has stabilised and then proceed with the vaccinations normally. I, in our service, we will offer a check blood counts sort of two weeks after a vaccination. But in reality, actually, it's quite clearly obvious for any parent who's been through ITP to know if there's been a recurrence. Um, but I'm sure most hospitals would be off, would be happy to check. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or you've got a follow-up question to any of that. Um, yeah, how long would you recommend waiting after the ITP? Um, if the counts have normalised, yeah. I would usually give it four weeks and then get on with it. Four weeks, okay. Right. Um, oh, sorry for hugging the, the questions here. But um, in your experience with uh, the treatment to rectify the IPT for our daughter was IVIG, um, and they actually gave her three transfusions. Was it three? I think she had uh, four platelet transfusions and two IVIGs before it worked. Yeah. So, so my question is, if we do the vaccines again, um, and it triggers the ITP again from the vaccines, is there a chance or danger that that course um, will not work as a as a solution to try and fix the IPT? So, do chance it won't work this time round, next time round. So again, obviously, from my experience, I've never actually seen anybody having a recurrence following the vaccinations. But what I always say to any family when I'm quoting that one in 20 chance of the ITP coming back, it, it tends to always behave as a completely new illness um, in the non vaccine associated ones. Sometimes they can last longer. Sometimes they can be shorter. Sometimes the drop in plate that can, can be less. Sometimes it can be more it basically behaves as a completely new. What I would say is it's generally exceptionally unusual for us to give plate the transfusions when we know we're dealing with ITP. 
often when the diagnosis is uncertain, we'll start off with platelet transfusions. And maybe yeah. because of the young age, they were a little bit uncertain at the begin with. Um, yeah. so IVIG, we tend to use mostly only if there's significant bleeding. But again, sometimes if people are concerned, especially around the young age, um, although actually the risk of bleeding, again, doesn't seem to be any more at the younger age. But was there actually any bad bleeding um, with your daughter? She had clots in her um, poo at one point, um, but no gushing. No, and she wasn't bleeding in like mm -hmm. a gushing way or any internal bleeding. So... Um, just the clots that but, came out but obviously that was quite scary when that happened yeah obviously yeah i'm sure but to, to your point john they um they did the platelets because they didn't at first they weren't 100 percent sure it was itp yeah what we saw was the pq or rush or whatever the medical term is I'm, I'm not a doctor but they saw the little we saw the spots and the rush and that's why we took it and so they were going through the steps of eliminating it so that's that's reassuring in your experience that they wouldn't even do the IVIG if they knew full well it was um, IP uh, IPT. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for hogging all the questions. That's okay. That's no okay. worries. Thank okay. you. No, no, thanks for your questions, Hannah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Could I ask Audrey, a question? Yeah. Go on, go yeah hi. Yeah. Um, so I'm completely new to this. My um my son, who's 15, <clears throat> was um diagnosed with possible ITP. They think it's ITP. Um, just two weeks ago. Um, following him having some spectacular bruising over a couple of days, really. Uh, he's quite an active, sporty boy, and so you know you see bruises and you don't really react initially. And then I was thinking, well, these just don't look right. <clears throat> and so we saw our GP quite quickly, and and um, he had a platelet count of two, and was actually admitted to hospital in the middle of the night by the out of hours GP who'd picked up the blood test results. So that was all quite panicky. When we got to the hospital, they weren't best pleased that that had happened. They said, no, that, that was a bit dramatic. You know, you could have come tomorrow. And so, of course, there was the initial sort of panic of it all. Um, he had repeat bloods um, a week later and, and platelet count was seven. So nothing really dramatic. And we were told not to expect anything. <clears throat> I suppose the question I've got really is one everybody seems like just like really relaxed about it at the hospital and I'm completely not relaxed about it obviously um and they're just going to see him again in three months which I think is pretty standard isn't it this kind of watch and wait protocol which is kind of driving me crazy really because it feels like we should be doing something <clears throat> so I guess I was looking for some reassurance that that's okay to sort of wait and we're taking obviously all the necessary precautions he stopped his karate and things for now and and school are being quite careful um but I guess my my kind of other question is, is that he's he's 15. So he's not like a really young child and he's not an adult. <clears throat> and I was reading something recently about there kind of being the need to kind of think about adolescents and young adults a little bit differently from very young children and older people who might get it like in their 50s. <clears throat> And of course, when I dared to say that to the paediatrician, she was just like, calm down, stop reading, you know, go home, live your life. Um, kept asking me, are you medical? Are you medical? Why are you reading this? I do work in the trust. I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm a psychologist. So I think I was driving them crazy, actually, in the first sort of uh, two, you know, first two appointments. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm asking in a roundabout way is just, is that the right advice? Just to kind of be calm, be cool, just wait till December till we get our next appointment. Um, the reason I'm asking is because this paper that I'd read said that um, in they looked at I think people who were like sort of 15 to 25 age group saying that actually at one at one year the best outcomes were the kids who'd been given early treatment um, and I don't know what's early whether three months is still okay and that's early or whether that's now and we should be doing something more actively now <clears throat> to give you the picture he's not bleeding at all he's not had any bleeding he's he's just had bruising and um, then he's had a, a big blister on his tongue but apart from that there's been no bleeding so we feel fortunate that it's not presented as dramatically as just the bruises okay I'll shut up and let you answer those <laughs> many questions no. thanks Audrey for sharing for sharing your story and yeah sympathies I 
you know, I deal with this day in, day out, but I, I do appreciate how scary it is when you get a phone call and told you've got to go up to the hospital now. Um, and part of that is because obviously the GP doesn't know necessarily what they're dealing with. Um, actually, it sounded like you had a very sensible team there in hospital because, again, sometimes they can be saying a whole load of other diagnoses that can be very scary. But his presentation, I, I would consider as fairly typical. Sort of yeah, his bloods were completely TP. normal otherwise, apart yeah. from the platelets. Yeah. And obviously the fact that he is otherwise well in himself, apart from the bruising and the blood count, otherwise normal, yeah. helps us be absolutely certain it's nothing like leukaemia or any of the nasties yeah. like that. And the only reason we generally do a blood count after one week is to make sure that that absolutely is the case. It's yeah. obviously lovely if the if the platelets have dropped up, you know, jumped up dramatically. But in most people in one week, they haven't jumped up. But again, if the other bloods, the neutrophils, the white cells, the hemoglobin, the other bits of the count have gone a bit skew with, um, then it tells us that we're dealing with something else. So actually... The point of a checked blood count one or two weeks after initial presentation isn't necessarily to see any improvement. It's just to be that 100 percent sure we're not dealing with any nasties there and it is ITP. Um, and then the, the reason why we hold off on treatment is that thankfully in a, at least sort of 50 percent of, of children within the first three months, the counts are generally getting getting better if not normalizing so half the kids will be returning towards normal after three months and that's still true in the adolescence population um and if you pop if the study you're quoting was the one from the isis switzerland group published about last year you'll probably actually find my name on there because i think we provided some of the the data to that um and i think all, all we're trying to say there is that some of the adolescents can behave more like adults some of them can you know behave a bit more like the younger children and actually without getting very very clever there's not really any good way of knowing and i think at the end of the day you know mervyn was talking about shared decision making you know teenagers have a whole host of other sort of challenges and if you're a psychologist you'll probably know a lot of those better than uh than I do but uh, you know we've got to listen to what they want listen to what their social needs are what their sporting needs what their education needs are uh, and balance all of those things up okay. from a practical point of view actually as you become more experienced with the ITP you will be able to look at him and tell us probably quicker than any blood test does what his plate that count is doing the, the lumpy bruising you're generally seeing when the plate is down below the 20 mark same with the pinprick rash once the plate does are up over the 50 mark um shouldn't actually bruise up more than any other kid mm -hmm. um so if, if you're still seeing big lumpy bruises and the pinprick rash, then it's probably down below the 20 mark at the moment. Yeah, the, the um, bruises the bruises are going, but it's because I'm like wrapping them in cotton wool and not letting them move, essentially. And, um, you know, up to the up to the time he was diagnosed, he's like play, like play fighting, fighting with his older brother and all sorts, you know, which is probably what yeah. contributed to the. So um, he's gone back to school because school were quite Good. anxious about it. But he's gone back and he's saying, stop, stop phoning me. Stop asking me if I'm OK. I'm I'm feeling fine. Um, so I'm trying to be guided by him and, and not share my anxiety too much with him because I want him to, if, if this is going to be something that he has to live with, I don't want it to be really negative from the beginning you know I want him to think it's something that he can manage and deal with although of course I'm hoping it's not going to be the case but yeah, can't I, know. I, yeah. And, and again at this moment early on the only time we would actually you know give him treatment with immunoglobulin or steroids yeah. would be if he was having potentially dangerous bleeding so I'm mm -hmm. hoping they've given you some advice as to when to get in touch but basically if you have yeah. a significant head bump prolonged yeah. nosebleed prolonged mouth bleeding yeah, any... they've given us some medication in case um tranexamic acid yeah they've given us that just in case um yeah i would always say get in touch with the hospital yeah. if there's any 
bleeding that you are worried about or any significant head bump. Um, but if you're worried, hopefully you've got a contact number. Um, otherwise, I think we've done a general parents guide, which Mervyn's got our, or used to have on the website. I, I think we were updating it, but I think it's still there. And I'm yeah. sure Mervyn can, can provide that about when to get in touch. Once the ITP has been going on for more than six months, um, it starts to become more likely that it's going to stick around. So between six months, well, between three months and six months, first of all, um, about um, another sort of, of those who still have active ITP, about sort of 50% will again get better over the next three months. So overall, about six months by the six month mark, sort of three quarters have resolved. Mm -hmm. Once it's been going on sort of for six months, um, in the remainder, about 25% will get better spontaneously in that next six to 12 month period. And then once it's been going on for a year, we, I generally quote sort of 10 to 20% chance of it going away on its own each year. So eventually it usually does. But once it's been going on for more than six months, we've then got access to a whole host of other treatments, which even if he's not bleeding, but is having significant impaired quality of life because he's not being able to get on with the things normally mm -hmm. and not being able to chill out, mm -hmm. then we can start accessing other treatments. Again, there's a fair bit of burden and more to in and fro into the hospital mm -hmm. with those treatments. So it's not always the right decision. And again, it yeah. comes back to this shared decision tool. Yeah. And there's lots of various different options, medicines, injections, um, daily, weekly, monthly things. So th there's, there's lots of different choices there, but there is choices. Um, and we would not ever sort of contemplate on leaving a 15-year-old with a perpetually low count and telling them that they can't go out, can't do things, etc. And it, it is important he's back in school. Yeah. The bruises, whilst they cause visual alarm, are certainly not dangerous. That It's just that theoretical very low risk that there could be a dangerous bleed there and certainly we wouldn't want him to be doing any sport when it's a potential risk of a heavy head bang yeah. because we yeah. know there's that small risk there that's great but just last thing sorry i'm hogging it now just one last question um he's turning 16 next month and um the he's under the care of just general pediatrics at the moment um they they were saying they weren't sure uh when they see him in December for the three month follow up, whether he will stay within paediatrics or whether they will transfer him to adult services. Um, do you have any do you have any view on that at, at the age of 16? Because I mean, it depends obviously on the outcome of what happens then. But it, say it, we uh, have to stay involved. Um, so obviously, if his counts have all got better, that's a fairly easy. Um, yeah. It then depends hugely as what the local setup is. I can tell you what, what setup that, here I'm is. I'm in Oxford. In yeah. yeah, so in, in Oxford, you know, there's, there's both, I know the, the adult people down there and I know sort of the paediatric people, that they're both exceptionally sort of good. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, both would carry on with an appropriate sort of okay. thing. Generally, people can... Uh, you know, what I do here is I'm happy to see new patients under the age of 16. Once I've got a patient over the age of 16, bearing in mind that it becomes slightly challenging to get them onto a paediatric ward over the age of 17, if I'm contemplating that we might be into this for the longer term, I would usually push that referral through to sort of my adult colleagues because it's stupid to start with me and then have to be transferred, yeah. you know, mid thing across. Um, the only exception to that is some of the clinical studies we were doing. So when we're looking at some of the novel treatments on the clinical trials, um, they need longer term follow up. So I sometimes will bring those to me if I can offer something different to what the adults. But that's quite unusual. And certainly for, you, for your lad who's relatively new into it, very unlikely to be in that setup. Um, so uh, I, I would just go with what the norm is in Oxford. Um okay. And yeah, they've they've got brilliant adult and pediatric hematology, but if, if it's still going on at the three months, he needs to be under hematology, whether that's pediatric or adult, okay. because the 
paediatricians, the general paediatricians, I'm pretty certain will not be able to access any of the treatments if he does need something other than the basic steroids or immunoglobulin early on. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Audrey. Um, anyone else got another question? Yes. Amy? Yes, yes, thank you. Hi. Um, my six-year-old son has ITP. He was diagnosed with it at a year and a half, so we're five years in. Um, I'd heard the statistic that you quoted before about sort of the, the chance getting smaller and smaller of, of spontaneous um, improvement. He has been, after sort of three years of watching and waiting, I convinced the team um, to start a treatment. And so he's on 75 milligrams of l trombopag once a day, um, having gone through 25 and 50 and, and seeing no improvement. 75 he's been on 75 now for just over two years or, or sorry he's been on ultramapang for just over two years I think we got to 75 after about six months of trial and error but his platelets are still very much on a roller coaster so whilst with height treatment he was always in the single figures and sort of the highest we ever saw was 20 treatment seems to get him into the teens and sort of maximum of 70 to 80. But until last week, we'd had eight months where he was always around the 20 to 30 mark. Last week, we got up to 70 something, um, 77, which is great. But I have two main questions for you. The first is his response when he heard that his platelets were at 77 was, oh, great, can I now play football at break time? Which unfortunately, we've not been able to do. We've, we've, we, we want to encourage football and playing, but it's very much controlled environment football. So skills and drills, but no free play. So my first question is, how do you manage that with a six and a half year old who's very active and boisterous and loves his sport and his activities? We are sort of encouraging him down tennis and golf and other sorts of non-team sports. And my second question is, I have started asking questions about should we be switching across and trying something else given that although the ultramba pag does a little bit it doesn't really do a huge amount um and uh, romiplostin has been bandied around and it's sort of uh let's have a think about this in the next couple of months conscious that that's a, a weekly injection um but i'd love to know your thoughts on switching from l pag to romiplostin and and sort of whether that's worth a shot at this for me it feels like it is worth a shot because the l pag hasn't quite done what we'd like it to do and we're not seeing spontaneous recovery but if you can give me a more medical view on that rather than a frustrated parent who just wants to solve the problem um, yeah that would be i just kick back just with a couple of other just quick queries has he, his counsel sort of ever near normalized with any treatment ever or is it always just been a, a little bit of a they near normalized and and went way beyond when he had a liver infection which actually okay. if it was time i wanted to come back and ask you about um hematology are very sure well they they seem pretty sure that it was not caused by the ultramba pag his liver infection pediatrics seem to think that it was um and so we're sort of in this who who knows what whether it could have been the medication or not um so that so but no we've never got to a near normal count when he's well uh, does he respond to immunoglobulin steroids at all or didn't not? respond to steroids that was the first port of call he did respond to an ivig when he split his lip um, and we needed to 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 try something, but it only seemed to last for three to four days. And then he was back down to sort of single figures again. Uh, and what did they go up to roughly with the immunoglobulin? They went up to over 100. OK, OK. So the reason I'm just going through that is obviously in the ITPs that are sort of persisted on sort of longer than normal and are not responding ideally to sort of our treatments. I always like to just go back and just challenge myself to make sure that I'm happy with ITP as being the diagnosis. But, you know, if he's responded, you know, like that with immunoglobulin, then, you know, we can be pretty much certain that this is ITP because I have seen a few people with sort of a congenital thrombocytopenia. That's, so that's a, an ITP 
So uh, a plate of production problem that you've been born with rather than the typical ITP. Um, and we usually go down sort of looking at genetics lines, which have become a lot easier to look for. But if it's responded well to immunoglobulin, then I'm absolutely happy with that. Um, and the, the L-trompopag certainly seems like a reasonable treatment to start with. Obviously, it's a normal drug. Um, in about 1 in 20 people on L-trompopag, usually early on, it can knock the liver enzymes. So when we're doing sort of blood tests, we see a couple of the markers of inflammation, the ALT or AST sort of jump up, and we generally get twitched if they're hitting sort of 10 times the limit of normal and would usually come off the medicine. Um, of course, infection can also do that, especially in a younger child, um, or the combination of the two can do that. And usually when we see that, if it's just down to the L-trompopag, we typically would stay off the drug. I'm assuming he's continued to have his liver test monitored. And if they're doing absolutely fine now on that 75 milligram dose, then I wouldn't be concerned about it. Um, 75 milligrams, as I'm sure you know, is the top dose that we would use in the ITP setting. Um, I did all of the clinical trial work in l trompopag that led to its licensing and overviewed couple of a hundred children across the world on l trompopag when it was first being used about 10 years ago. Um, so although we think of it as a new treatment, you know, we've been using it, you know, over 10 years now. Um, but we generally would be aiming for a count of over 50 really on the l trompopag we don't need to a normal count, but we generally would be trying to achieve a count of over 50. In some people, you don't get that. And if it's bringing it up to a, a level at which he's free from bleeding, then would often would be happy with that. Um, I, if the counts generally aren't coming up into the 50s and are generally staying down in the 20s, I would usually discuss with families about switching to remiplastin, um, which is, is your subcutaneous one. Again, yeah. I did all of the work on remiplastin, and we had quite a few people who switched from one to the other. In general, if what if we're switching either from l pag to remiplastin or romiplastin to l pag I generally still would quote a, about a sort of 50 to 60% chance of responding to the alternative agent. Obviously, you've got a little bit of a tricky dilemma if you if it's going up a little bit, but not quite adequately. Um, however, you can always switch back, and we've never seen anybody who hasn't responded to, you know, who's come off it and then gone back on it, losing their responses. So it would be it'd be reasonable to try it. Um, I've actually got probably about 15, 20 kids who I'm overviewing currently on remiplastin. And although injection sounds a little bit frightening, you know, it's not too different to a diabetic injection, which people are often doing several times a day. And yeah, let's be honest, he's not going to like it for that one little second of it going in, but it, it'll be done with within a few seconds. And if he's got a fraction of a tummy where you can put it in and pinch half an inch sort of thing. It, it should be relatively straightforward. And I'm sure your local team would teach you how to do it. And it's fairly easy. It doesn't have the liver inflammation. So actually it often involves less blood tests. Um, but certainly if the liver inflammation has been called a concern, that would have benefit. The slight challenge with remiplastim, unlike l where you've just got a 25, 50 and 75 milligram dose, is you can make up a syringe to whatever you like. Um, most people tend to start on a one per kilo dose, build it up to 10. I'd probably start at the five dose, then build it to the seven, then build it to the nine and build it to the 10. And from our studies, the average dose that people needed was sort of six per kilo. Um, some people have used both together. I'm not particularly keen on using multiple drugs because you're exposing to multiple different things. Um, so I, I tend to switch from one to the other. Um, some of my colleagues will often throw in 
an immunosuppressant drug, either a low dose steroids or something that we call mycophenolate or sirolimus alongside one of them, rather than switching. Personally, I always prefer to try and do things with one drug rather than complicate things. So I would probably be inclined to give the remipostim a bash. Um, and then you know, with regards to your, the other part of your question, sports and activities, well, actually at six, it's a lot easier than 15 when mm -hmm. you know he's relatively small, his centre of gravity is closer to the ground, the people he's playing with are relatively small as well. And most of sports, football and things, involves giving the ball a bit of a kick and then generally running from one end of the playground or one end of the football ground to the other. Um, and trying to maintain some level of healthy activity is good. I think you've got a sensible approach there if you're doing the general drills. Um, there's generally a move in football to avoid headering the ball and too much things. If he gets a tackle, he's just going to get a bit of bruising in his legs and other than shin pads. You know, unless it's a day where he's absolutely covered in bruises, personally, I probably would let him get on with things really at that age. Um, but yeah, if he was covered in bruises on a day, then yeah, I probably would encourage him to sit out. And it might be easier if he's unable to understand that of just keeping him off and sticking with what you've got going at the moment. But yeah, as with the 15 year olds, it's a degree of sort of compromise all of the way through. Um, I still would expect that this is going to burn itself out at some time. But, you know, I generally quote 10 to 20 percent each year. I've got a handful of kids um, and I can think of them on sort of one hand who presented to me sort of around the one year mark and have still got ITP after 16 years. But bearing in mind, I see about sort of 60 to 80 kids each year and I've been doing this 20 odd years. Um, that's quite a small proportion. Um, so hopefully it will get get better in time. But I, I would suggest having a try with the remitter stim on that. OK, great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I hope you did find that helpful because it was a fairly succinct answer. So, yeah, fairly detailed yeah. answer. OK, any other questions? I think Audrey, who was it? Oh, no, sorry. I was saying yeah, the was phone. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. DL's iPhone. You're on mute at the moment. I think she's locked up. Anyone else got a question? Oh, I'd just, oh, just, like, just like to make a comment there that, you know, obviously it's very dis distressing for, for for parents, if not their children. And, um, you know, the little ones probably don't understand more of the implications. Um, but I think it's, you know, what John was saying with it about, you know, letting them have as normal a life as possible. You know, it's all a balance of risk, isn't it? And it's really difficult if you sort of keep saying to them, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. They feel really sort of restricted. So, you know, as a parent, it is tremendously worrying. Um, I ha haven't had a child with ITP. I was the one who had the ITP. Um, but, it, you know, from uh, the person who's got the ITP as well uh, can be very worrying. And I think you have to um, sort of, uh, I don't know, it's very difficult to say to people, you know, don't worry too much about it. But really, the more you worry about it, the worse it gets. You know, we've got to try and put it in perspective of, you know, we're doing the right thing being here tonight, learning all about it. You know, John is really reassuring, giving us all the answers. He's got lots and lots of experience. And so I think hopefully you will go away tonight and feel more reassured and that, you know, you can make some of the decisions on, you know, common sense about what's happening with your children um, and make the decisions and, you know, put it in perspective, get out there, live your life, have a good day every day and deal with whatever might happen when it happens and be vigilant. 
But, you know, it's an awful thing to have it hanging over you and to, you know, worry yourself to death about it. When, you know, John has got loads of experience with children, I think he's been really reassuring tonight. And, um, you know, you, you don't really have to worry about it every day. It's obviously something there. But, you know, try and chill out a bit if you possibly can and yeah. do nice things. Enjoy the things you do. And I think Derek would agree with that. Derek's another um, person who's had ITP long term. And uh, I think he would agree with all of that. Thanks, Rhonda. And if I if I can just jump in again on that, I had been taking a fairly sort of pragmatic approach, um, which had been really strongly encouraged by the consultants we're we're under. And um, my the issue I've actually come up against this school year is our specialist nurse provided a document to the school which said no contact sport bold underlined um and school have then sort of said we have we can't go against this medical advice so this the teacher the matron at school and I have been sort of questioning and pushing back but that has then made me nervous that I think well hold on what am I pushing here for I'm pushing to put my child in a vulnerable a potentially vulnerable and risky situation and I think that's just where it's it's caused me quite a lot of turmoil and questions because suddenly he's he really wants to play football apparently last year it was academic and he never went to the football at break time anyway was this year he does want to and I really don't want to be that parent that says you can't do something and so that's where we've come up with skills and drills and different things that can be done but it's tricky when the medical advice is saying no contact sport bold and underlined and school school isn't going to go against that he then comes out of school and runs around the playground when I'm picking him up and goes crazy yeah, but, absolutely um, yeah, I think it's difficult. You know, we I try to avoid making blanket statements like that. My my usual question is, what do you do normally? What do you actually want to be doing? And what compromise can we come up with? Um, we are, you know, through sort of Mervyn and sort of through other groups, you know, we have set up sort of a nurses forum um, um, to try and sort of standardise these things a little bit better. Um, but just like a, there is across the doctors, there's sometimes slight differences of opinion. There is also across the nursing teams. Um, and I suspect that's just a standard form that is usually written for an older patient, sometimes with an inherited other blood condition, such as haemophilia or something rather than ITP. And, you know, I, I would say don't necessarily always accept those sorts of things and do be prepared to challenge those if it doesn't make sense and is different to the conversations that you have been having um, in the clinics. And I don't think any of us would be offended ever by a, a patient coming and challenging the questions, you know, or something that we've put in a letter. And very commonly, sometimes things even sometimes get put in by the admin team as a standard thing that they usually they put in and have just put it in by mistake sometimes. So just be Amy, prepared to uh, challenge if you What we've also to... got, Amy, is um, on our website, we've got uh, some guidelines for school clubs and play groups. So that's, I previously provided the Europe, yeah. the, the ITP Association's um, guidelines for his first and second year of school. And then it's this year, the specialist nurse said, look, do you want me to come and speak to the teacher? I said, okay, yeah, that would be great. And I'm now really regretting allowing that to yeah, happen. Yeah, um, yeah. But he wears a little scrum cap type helmet um, when he's going outside and doing those sorts of activities. And I sort of felt that playing football with that helmet on would be okay. But, you know, what I would say, uh, I'm actually involved in a rather large football club with about 120 teams. And about 30 of them are tens and under you know, 30 teams. Yeah. And, you know, the FA protocol now is no heading. Okay? So, yeah. um, so my concern know, was we've got loads of children with, heads. yeah, you know, we've got loads of children with various medical conditions who enjoy and play football. And it's great, you know, to get them out in the fresh air. And yeah. as long as it's in a controlled environment and the coach, which is very, very important, the coach and the teachers must be made fully aware of the condition, um, you know, just in case, worst case scenario, something does happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Derek, do you, do you want to jump in there? Can't hear you, Derek. We come back to Derek. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. it. That's it. Go on, Derek. No, we still can't hear you. Yeah. I'm just wondering if the lady on the DL phone, iPhone has managed to <laughs> unmute. We've got, got a question. No, we've lost her again. Yeah, yeah, there she uh, is. Is it working now? Yes, Brilliant. it is. Yeah, I can hear you now. Really, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I did <laughs> it on okay. my phone tonight. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, my, um, I have to say, this has been brilliant. My son is 11. He's been diagnosed since he was four, and I've never done anything like this. And tonight has probably given me more information than I've been able to um, understand in, in the past seven years. So thank you very much. It's It's been awesome. Um, my, I guess a lot of my questions have already been answered, but we've just started, Oliver, on um, El Trombopag. Um, and the last two weeks, he's had his highest readings that we've ever had before. So he's always under 10 normally. Um, and now he's up to 77, uh, which the results come in just two days ago. And obviously this has triggered a lot of questions for us um, because he's never um, he's never been this high. He's never been this well. He's never had so much energy. Um, and being such a good boy, um, we've had a bit of um, problems with um, just being so tired and irritable. Um, so anyway, we've started this medication and I guess for us is do the long term of being on medication um, for someone who's 11, um, is is it normal for them to stay on it for a long time or is it best to experiment and in, a, in X amount of time stop him and see what happens to his levels? Do we see if they come down or... Um, so what are the... Different... So normally when I'm starting somebody on l Trump pag I, I would usually counsel families, say, we'll give this a go for six months. Um, most of the time, people need to be on it for a couple of years. Now, obviously, underneath the l Trump pag historically, we still tended to quote that 10 to 20% chance per year of it getting better, and that continues to remain. Um, there's a variety of studies that have been done which suggests that when you're on any active ongoing ITP treatments, whether it be l trump PAG, Ramiplastim, or even just weekly immunoglobulin, um, then possibly you can induce what we call immune tolerance, i.e. you can overwhelm the immune attack that's happening on the plate. That's and you know, we've published work suggesting about 50% of the children on l trump PAG are able to come off it within a couple of years. Um, and obviously when we we monitor the plate that counts, if the plate that counts go up particularly high, we can reduce the dose. Um, what I would say is I'd, I I would generally encourage him to enjoy a sort of life of not having to worry about ITP for a good period of time, whether that's mm. six months, 12 months. And then if his platelets are sort of persisting over the 50 mark, my usual standard would be, you know, even if the counts haven't gone up to sort of, you know, into the normal, would still just to be to try and just reduce the dose a little bit. Um, yeah. What I normally see, let's say if somebody's normally on 75 milligrams and I drop it down to 50, usually after the initial cutting dose, you see an initial drift down of the counts. Sometimes the natural thrombopoietin needs to kick in then and it to go back up. So whenever you do any dose reduction, there's always a drop. But then if you brave it out, it often then picks back up. And I, I will usually discuss with families and work out when we're going to do that. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do it prior to any big family holiday or any other big life events, exams or whatever. So we would negotiate when we were doing that. But I think if he's just started on the L-Tromper PAG and he, for the first time you're seeing counts over 50, yeah, I would just say let's just enjoy it for a while, stop yeah. having to stress about the ITP, let him do more things normally, um, and then six months to a year down the line, when feels right, challenging him with a dose reduction and see whether he's still truly needing it or not. 
Um, yeah. And as I say, our experience is about half of the kids come off it. And as I said, when speaking about the clinical trial that we did, every single child who I had in the, in the study sort of over 10 years ago is no longer old, on l trompopag and no longer needing treatment. So they've all gradually got better. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. We'll keep going with it anyway for now and yeah, see how it goes. He He's also due to have another um, MMR vaccination, um, which we suspect was the reason for his RTP in the first place. Should we wait a little while and give this a trombo pag a bit more time and then do the do the vaccination um, just to make sure that it stays high? Yeah. If anything, while his count's up now, it's possibly a good time to do it. I, again, I probably would want him to have been on the treatment for about sort of four, six weeks. And if you see it, if he's been on it that time, it it might cause a, a transient swing in the counts. It might most mm. likely it will do nothing. Um, but I, I would see no reason, you know, not to go ahead with the MMR vaccine. Um, yeah. I sometimes, and again, you ask 10 different doctors this, you'll get 10 different opinions. I, mm. uh, unless the children are high risk of getting problems associated with flu, such as, you know, obviously if they've got asthma, if they've got any heart things, you know, they must have the flu vaccine. But, you know, flu vaccine is an optional thing um, unless the child is at high risk of having complications of flu, I, I would often hold off the sort of seasonal flu vaccine. Because um, again, sometimes, you know, as commonly I've seen that sort of effect in the counts. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good. Thank you very much. Stuff. Thank you very much. Any other questions, anyone? I just say, just coming back just to one last oh. point. Obviously, it's 11 at the moment. Um, yep. Just be aware that certainly, I'm not sure where you're based, but certainly in England, we've now got access to Ava Trump PAG from 12 years and upwards. Um, and I did quite a lot of work to get us access to that in England. Uh, the okay. Ava Trump PAG is like L Trump PAG, it's an oral drug, but the great advantage in the kids is you, you don't have the dietary interference. Um, so it means you don't have to worry about all of the, the food restrictions and all of that. So once turns 12, mm. if he's been responding well to l trompopag, he certainly should respond well to a the trompopag. It's a okay. slightly better formulation, mm. really, of it. Mm. Sorry, I should have said I am in England, where it, um, came, regardless of my accent, we are uh, with Adam Brooks at Cambridge. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, dear. Thank you. Any other okay. questions? Derek, are you back on now? Can you speak or? No, no, I uh, still can't hear you, sir. Never mind. No doubt you'll give me a call tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Hannah, Gina, Petra, anyone? I think Derek got too many computers. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I probably hear his car backfiring all the way across in Manchester from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> You know, poor old Derek's been on lots of calls today already. So yeah. Oh, poor Derek, he's exhausted. Okay. You know, it's, good of, it's good of you to come, Derek. Anyway, I hope that, um, you know, people feel, I'm sure you do, feel reassured um, by all of the, you know, knowledge that John has brought to tonight. And, um, you know, if you do need anybody to talk to, there are the um, mentors um, I'm one of them. Derek's one of them. There's a lovely lady called Karen. And we also have a, a new gentleman whose name is Derek. Who's his, what's Tim. his name? Tim. Tim. Right. So, you know, there are people you can talk to if you um, do need to have a chat. And if you initially send an, well, you go through the office, but then if uh, we get an email, um, we will contact you and then perhaps have a, a chat. We can do a WhatsApp chat or something like that. And I, I actually did that yesterday with a with a, a lady, an adult who had um, who's just been diagnosed with ITP. 
And that was, she said that was really helpful. So, you know, just sometimes talking about it can be helpful. Excellent. Okay. If there's no other questions, I think we call it a day. Thank you, John. No, you my pl absolute right pleasure. Down? I'm always happy to to come on some of these, Mervyn, and uh, look forward to continuing to support Great the stuff. group. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking part and hope to see you again in the not too distant future. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Night, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you.